Ons was dienstplichtige sinds tanne mag, die mannen en vrouwen, die hele SAW en seens broederskap, wie vanaf die 60er, dier die 70er en tot die 80er jaar op die grens en elders, ons mense probeer verdedig en beskerm het. Om die kampvier gesels ons oor die lach en die huil, die stap en die hardloop, die drul en die marcheer, die oefen en die ontspan, die werk en die speel, die sweet en die rust, die vastbuit en die jip hou, die val en die opstaan, die baklui en die weg hardloop, die suksesse en die mislukkings. Maar ook die bloei en die doodgaan, die treur en die vroeging en vooral die onthou. Ons onthou ons helde en gevallen makkers en die gewone soldaten en politiemannen van troep tot kopraal tot sersant tot officier, wit, zwart, bruin en geel, wie saam onder die oranje, blanje, blauw gedien het in Suidwest en Angola en Rhodesia en Mozambique en in Suid-Afrika self. Om die kampvier vertel ons hulle stories, maar laat ons hulle ook self terugdink en pijns en onthou. Om die kampvier, aangebied dier Willem Rad. Goeie naad, luisteraars. Ons is weer eens by Om die Kampvier. En vanavond sy gas sit daar in P. En ons het so'n bykie gesukkel om op die lucht te kry, maar hy is nou uiteindelik hier. En ter inleiding wil ek miskien net, voordat ek vir hom welkom heet, wil ek net na die titel verwees. Ons het om genoem vanavond sy uitsending RPG Afrika. Nou die van u wat nog die weermacht dinge onthou, RPG staan vir RPG 7, dit is die Russiese vuurpeil lanseerder. Hy is redelijk oud, maar beslis nie koud. Hy was in ons tyd reeds, uh, reed, definitief nie een nieuwe wapen nie, maar so betrouwbaar en so goed Russiese wapen, dat um, vir een baie lang tyd het die Afrikaanse Weermacht die RPG amtelijk gebruik in sy rol. En sy rol is die van mandraagbare tankafweerwapen, met ander woorde die vuurpil wat jy afskiet met die lanseerder uh, kan een tank sy wand dierboor en een tankbasis immobiliseer. En dit is natuurlijk dan ook die ideale wapen om voertuig oor die algemeen uit te haal. En Rick moet maar later vertel, hy het een speciale plekje in ons eenheidse anale wat dit aan betref maar ek gaan dit vir hom los om dit te vertel, net iets nog oor die RPG self, dit is een verskrikkelijk eenvoudige wapen, dit is eindelijk net een buis, en dan sit jy die vuurpeil wat so lang sterkt het, wat in die buis pas, sit jy hom voor in, en dan ty een sneller mechanisme binnen in die buis, en dan mik jy en jy skiet. En ons het altyd, uh, daar die dag, in die 70's al, het ons maar basis die wapen gebruik as ze mocht het troffe, jy mik en jy skiet en ons het nooit eindelijk oor die versier uh, ons was nooit oor die versier geplaan, ja, daar was een versier en ons het om gesien, maar ons het nog nie eindelijk gebruik en ons het maar altyd geskiet met oop versier uh, al waarvoor jy die versier gebruik het partij keer was om te bepaal wat die afstand is na het teiken toe, want hy het so'n klein prentje binnen in die versier waar, wat jy oor die teiken sit en dan kan jy sê hoe ver het is maar verder was het maar een verskrikkelijk eenvoudige wapen. En uh, toe een dag, daar my koesje in Zambie na kampaar val te tel ek so'n papier, so'n boekie op. En waarachtig, dis in, dis in Engels geskryf. Een boek oor die RPG, een handboek oor die RPG in Engels. Om my langs toe die kort te maak, toe ons nou terug is, en ek lees die ding dier, toe kom ek achter, maar die wapen, lyk so eenvoudig, maar eindelijk is dit een heel, het is in Engels sê, nifty weapon. En uh, het is nogal interessant dat die vuurpeil, as hy nou een vlug is, dan uh, het hy sy eie eigenskappe. En as jy nou wil afmik vir wind, sê nou waar die wind kom van links na rechts, dan sou jy nou dink, jy moet nou afmik dier na links te mik om op te maak vir die wind. Met die vuurpeil is het precies omgekeerd. Want soos die vuurpeil trek, as daar wind is, dan stoot hy om, 
omdat hij daar een groot vlek heeft achter en stoot hij om in die wind in. Zo so, harder die wind, hoe meer gaan die, vuur, uh, die vuurpijl in die wind in. Zo so, als je wel afmaakt van wind, dan moet je weg maak van die wind af. Dit maar net zo so te loops. Goed, Rick, baie welkom bij Omni Kamp Vier. Dank je wel, is lekker om samen met jou te gezels weer. En dank je omdat ik het Ja, nee, dus uh, dat was net te plezier. En omdat je Engels sprekend is van huis en ons is allemaal nog aan die oude Zuid-Afrika verknig, verknog en uh, ons laat je toe, ons vraag je eindelijk om in jou eie taal te praten. ons verstaan allemaal Engels en dan is het voor jou makkelijker. So, my eerste vraag aan jou is gewoonlik, hoe het so mooi seens is jy nou in die lelike horribale SAV in seens beland? Jo, Willem. Ik is, ek is, ek het met matriek geskryf in um, 1977 en toe word ek vir een jaar uh, deferment, deferment, toe werk ek op die plaas en 1999 het ek, uh, was ek opgeroep van Middelburg, Voorsaai, en, en, en uh, gaan ek bysiks daar so, en dan het ek uh, gevolunteer ge, ge vir die junior leaders course in Oudsoorn. Want ek het geweet van 3-2, en 3-2 en daar daar was baie geheimig en alles, maar ek het een pel wat in die unit was, en hy het my vertel, een bykie wat aangaan daar. So my, my goal was to end up going to 3-2. So I went to Oudsoorn and I did the junior leaders course, and in, in about October 79, uh, Falcon and Pep van Sale, I think it was Pep van Sale, Sergeant Major Pep van Sale, came down to Oudsoorn and they recruited um, volunteers. Well, of course, I was first in the queue and uh, I put my name down and anyway was, was selected to go and with 70 other blokes, we ended up going up to flying up to Rundu and there we landed um, and were welcomed at the Rundu airport by Sergeant Major Pep van Sale. It was October so it was the end of, the end of our winter or whatever and Blixen, when that uh, when that C-130 or 60 whatever it was, the back door opened and that heat hit us then we knew, yo, hierdie plek is warm but <clears throat> yeah, so that was the start of my military career, Willem yeah, and then the first place you went to was probably Buffalo, eh? Yeah, we, <clears throat> were, well, obviously we were welcomed by Sergeant Major Pep Van Sale and Falcon was there, and um, they told us more or less what was going to happen, and then they put us on Queerfuls, and we drove, what is it, 200 kilos or something from Rindu to, to Buffalo, <clears throat> and we ended up getting to Buffalo just before sunset. Yes, like, and I'll never forget... Um, driving through the gates and seeing the troops and they obviously all knew that we were new guys and they you know they put on a big show and then we drove down towards the river where the ops tent and the and the and the admin area used to be and they offloaded us there and the feeling of being in the unit you know was just unbelievable and it was yes it was like a dream come true but we still weren't we still weren't members of 32 because there were still a lot of things that we had to do to, you know, to get in. But anyway, we, we got there and, they, and we, they put us in tents and uh, they welcomed us and we had a beer or two and uh, they, I think they had a braai for us. And we spent the first week in, in, um, in Buffalo doing orientation and, and acclimatization where we didn't do too much physical stuff because of the heat and, and getting used to the, you know, the environment and that. And where we did... Uh, we did small courses like um, radio and signals, uh, basic medical aid for gunshot wounds, um, a little bit of um, um, navigation skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this this went on for a week, and then um, we had to do selection. And Pep Van Sale was the selection leader, and he was helped by Charles Muller and Jim Ross and Pit Fouri and Swart Pit. Zach Garrett was there, Gavin Mon, and then a whole lot of other oaks from one recce from Fort Doppies um, came and also helped with the selection. Um, I can remember Peter Bowles was there, F.L. Smith was there, but anyway, 
yeah, so uh, at some unholy hour of the night, the, the two shots rang, bang, bang, and then we had to form a tura outside our tents, and they marched us to the troops, Manasi, where the pre-rev started, and yassi, that was a lot of fun, eh? <laughs> Because nobody knew what was going on. We were just shouted at and told to do press-ups and run, go and get sticks this long and that thick. And you didn't know how thick and how long it was, but you just had to run. And yeah, and they kept us awake all night. And then they put us on on queer fools again. And they took us somewhere blindfolded and they dropped us off. And that was the start of selection. I think I spoke to a few guys today uh, to try and verify the figures. But I think there was about... 70, 75 guys that started the selection, and I think it was about 30 of us that that, that finished it. So there was a there was a lot of a lot of casualties during selection, but I suppose those guys wouldn't have made it anyway. So it's better that they left then, you know. Yeah. Um. Anyway, the, yeah, selection came and went. There were some funny times at selection. I mean. Um. One of the a couple of the incidents was uh, we had to get to RVs at a certain time, and if you didn't, then you were kicked off the course, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I remember getting to a, an RV, and I could smell. Of, of course, on selection, you don't get no food. There's you don't get issued with rats and stuff. There's no food. Anyway, I could smell coffee and biscuits, you know, rusks. Now we haven't eaten for a couple of days, so you can imagine we're hell of a hungry. Eh? And we had to get, as we arrived, we were put in, in, a, in a line and then the RV was closed and those that didn't make it were obviously taken away and those that were made that made it was told, listen, uh, there's uh, coffee and rusks for you as there and those, what were those things called again? You know, those steel things, man, you know, hot boxes. Hot uh, boxes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Anyway, the... the there was coffee and rusks in, in the hot boxes and Pep and Sale told everyone, he said to us, listen guys, you can take as much as you want, but just remember one thing, whatever you take, you will eat and you will finish. Yeah, so I was a little bit worried about that, but anyway, I, 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 I took a couple of little rusks and I took a small bit of coffee and nobody was allowed to eat and would drink anything until, uh, until uh, you know, the, the, the butt you know, before the grace was said. And the grace was said, and then uh, the O's uh, tucked in. And of course, the, the coffee was with salt instead of sugar, and the rusks were uh, had crushed up um, anti-malaria pills in them, so they was bitter as hell. Some O's took bush at loads of biscuits and rusks and, and lots of fire buckets full of, uh, of coffee. And yeah, they had to, <laughs> they had to finish that stuff. <laughs> There was quite a few boys after that. <laughs> it's nasty. <laughs> yeah, that's just one of the funny things that happened. And um, your selection came and went. And sorry, not not funny at the time, eh? Yeah, yeah. Look, <laughs> at the time it was quite serious. I mean, you know, you're hungry and and yeah, you 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 just want to give up, eh? You know, you. But yeah, you keep going, you know, and um, yeah, you see. You, you, you had to have a, a goal, you know, and, and then it was okay. They, they could have done anything to me and I wouldn't have worried because I wanted to be there, you know. But yeah, I'll, I'll, Sergeant Major Pep, for some reason or other, he, I don't know, he quite liked me. Um, and at, at one of the RVs, uh, I was sitting there and you didn't have to get up and streck anybody, you know, while you were on selection, but you just had to be, like, polite, you know. Anyway, and he walked past me and he said, yeah, you're playing the Engelsman, and, and, and he walked off and he flicked something at me. And when I saw what it was, I was quite shocked. It was it was a cigarette. It was a Gunston cigarette. Yes, and but of course I had no matches or any way of lighting it. And a little bit later, he walked past again and he flicked something else, and it was a half a match. And a little bit later on, he walked past again and he flicked me the corner of a matchbox. So now I had everything that was required to smoke. <laughs> but if you were caught, then you were off the course. So, yes, like, I didn't know what to do. Eh? Um, I didn't know whether I, t I should smoke it or whether I should give it back to him or what. But anyway, of course, the, the, the you know, the list got the better of me and myself and Gary Swart, uh, Blackie Swart, we, <laughs> that evening we smoked that cigarette and it was the best cigarette I've ever had in my life. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, that was selection. Selection wasn't that bad, Willem. It was, 
more in the mind than anything else, you know. Um, the last day was probably the toughest because we all got to the final RV and we were told this is the last RV tomorrow we go back to Buffalo and, you know, selection's over. And we were all resting, waiting at about 10 o'clock. The, the queer fool arrived and uh, bang, bang, for Matura, you know, we, we lined, we formed it, formed up. And then Pep said, Mana, ek het a groot verrassing vir julle. And he called one of us and he said, Gaan kyk op die kweefoel wat leed daar. So the eye ran up and he looked into the kweefoel and there were poles. Like a long f- poles, you know. Yeah, and that was uh, the f***est part of selection because then we were each allocated uh, two, two to a pole and they were quite long poles. And then the, the march, 30k speed march with poles started back to Buffalo and we had to get there before nightfall. And that was quite heavy, I must say. That, that was quite sore. But yeah, we made it. It was lekker. Now you being short, who was your mate? Oh, shit, yeah. Um, I, yeah I, my mate was uh, Smoothie Baumeister. He was a taller. He was about six foot six. Jeez. So it, I think he was about that tall. He was a m- tall. Do you remember him? Well, I'm, eh? oh, I remember him well, yeah. Well, maybe not six foot six, but he was, he was much taller than me. I think I'm five foot eight. So he was about six foot whatever, you know. And and for each one of his his uh, f- uh, um, uh, things you know, steps he took, I had to. It was two for me. So when he was running, I was sprinting. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you had to carry more weight because the pole was going downwards. Well, it, yeah, as well. <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, that was yeah that was us myself and Smoothie. We uh, we ran that yeah but uh, yeah so that was a tough that was the toughest for me was that last day of him yes like. But anyway, we made it, and of course we got back to Buffalo, and there was a lack of bra with a couple of beers, and then selection was over, and then you realise now you're part of the unit, and and that was lacquer. That was in 1980, yeah, or still 79. Uh, Willem, it was uh, it was about November 1979. So, what where was your first op when you went on op then? Well, our first op was after the selection we did. Um, Training in in, in, in uh, down at, at Nova de Marsha or, or Lakuhuki down there, you know, at the at the Buffalo training area, and we we did, you know, all this. We, we would, you know, we we were taught how how to how three two operated, you know, in terms of, you know, bases and all that sort of stuff. And that was, and then we did minor tactics with with some of the Ricky blokes and. And from and after that, then they selected everybody for the various companies, and then um, Zach Garrett and Gavin Mon uh, chose uh, um, Smoothie Baumeister and myself to join the recce group, and the other guys went to the platoons, and I was ch- chosen to go to the recce group. And my first op was um, at the Rico. Remember, we we, we were going to attack it. The companies were going to attack the Rico. Was it Tirico or was it Kalai? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Quite. No, that was Tirico. That was Tirico. Was Tirico. Yeah. And and uh, I can remember four of us were supposed to. Well, we, when when the troops all got to the river to go across, uh, the word came back that the the the, the MPLA had, had had left the base, and they, and, and obviously uh, Falcon didn't want to send a whole lot of us across. And there was nothing really to go and fight, so he he sent he sent us in to go and look to see uh, what was happening inside the base. And and of course, the two new recruits uh, at the recce group were chosen to go with Zach Garrett and Don Delaray. Uh, Don Delaray wasn't in the recce group, but I, but I think he was with CSI or or maybe Special Forces or something. But he was a nice oak. But anyway, he, he it was us. But uh, Smoothie developed a, a, a tongue pain. He got a toothache. And then um, I think you sent him back to the recce house at Buffalo. Was it you or was it was it somebody else, Willem? I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember that. But anyway, you can. Anyway, help. so he went back to the recce base, and it was only the three of us that went over. And we we went we went into the base, and we counted how many O's were there, and there was very few. And at the time, we were busy, uh, you know, hiding or taking their, their weapons away from them and trying to, if their boots were off, we were tying their boot laces together. And um, then one of the people woke up and heard, and saw us and they and they, were, okay, okay, and they started shouting and that. And then we took off down the hill towards the river with gunshots and all that stuff after us. And when that happened, hey, Willem, then I realized, 
Muti, now I'm really in the real thing. This is not a joke anymore. This is serious stuff. And ran and we we got away and we dog legged and all that stuff for the rest of the evening and we hid in the thicket of the bush for the rest of the of that next day and we could hear them looking for us. Yes, like and I was only I was worried. I tell you, I thought myself, I'm gonna, my first op and I'm going to end up in a, in a in an Angolan jail. But yeah, they didn't find us and, and later that night they they came and and, and took us across the river with with the rabbit duck and we went back to back to Buffalo for the debrief. That was my first op. That was quite a year op. Ah, it was an interesting op. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Rick, what happened then? Oh, um, yeah, then, then uh, Willem, you will remember as well, um, at the same time, just after that, well, obviously the troops never went and attacked that base because it was not worth it. And then, yes, the Alzheimer's is bad, but I, I remember we didn't, I didn't get... I didn't get to see Amahani for a long time because, well, for many weeks, because just after that op, um, you and most of the other recce blokes ended up coming back to Buffalo and we ended up staying in the recce house right at the end of the lines. Remember that that house? Yeah, yeah. On the hill. That. And we, the reason why we did that was because we had to we had to do a practice run with clippers uh, to, to blow a bridge. And, and that bridge was at was at was either Kalai or also at Tariko. I can't remember. I think it was at Kalai that bridge. Uh, it was at Tariko. It was a bridge across the um, Quito River, but down the down down river. Yeah, it down river near Tariko. That's right. It was there. Yeah, it was not at Tariko. That's right. It was just past there. And, and you 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 taught us because none of us had ever used clippers before. But you'd had had you'd had the privilege and experience of working with them before. So. You did it. You gave us instruction on them, and we pr- practiced and practiced and practiced to go and blow that bridge. Anyway, we 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 we, we rode up there. Yes, like and I. But yeah, I can't remember the, all the details, Willem. It's, it's, it escapes me. But I remember that my partner in crime was a guy called Daisy. Uh, Daisy Lobsha. Yep. Lobsha. 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 Yeah. And um, me and him were partners in the in the clipper. And yeah, we rode and we laid the dams, and the and the bloody thing didn't go down. It was damaged, but it didn't go down. And then we had to go back again, and finish the job. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah, that. And anyway, the second time it did go down, um, much to everybody's um, relief and stuff. But it was more difficult the second time because by now they'd woken up to the fact that this bridge was 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 a strategic target. And they had guards that were walking up and down. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Remember the mosquitoes? Woo! Yes, you I do. That that must have been... And, and remember the, the one day we spent lying on a little island for the whole day in the boiling sun because we couldn't move anywhere. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, the mozzies. This, I remember the mozzies most. You see, the they mozzies. were horrible. Horrible. Whoa. Horrible things, yeah. And if millions, you kill, if you kill one, a thousand are coming to the funeral. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and they suck you dry, eh, those things, yeah. Yes, sir, that was agony that day. Uh, it was, eh? And then, yeah, after that film, then we did normal, normal opses with you. I, I mean, uh, I was I was uh, uh, assigned to Zach and Gavin Monstick, and we worked Zach and you, you your, your stick and Zach stick. We our two sticks did a lot of work together. I seem to remember. Um, yeah, my first contact was um, just just before we shot the jeep. I remember, um, I can't remember the area where it was, but we we were in we were in and I think it was in Nana, and they flew us in towards the end of the end of the day. The pumas dropped us, and we walked a bit, and then we walked some more, and then the next minute there was a contact, and we shot one of them, and we walked a little bit further after that, and then we heard the jeep coming. And we just missed like, uh, doing the, the immediate ambush, and he and he drove off. And then you said, "No, he's going to come back again." So we so we now we laid another ambush, and he came back just before it got dark. And I remember, um, I remember Gavin or Zach saying to me, "Rick, go further, go further, go further." Yes, and I didn't want to go too far away from everybody. You know, I was a bit bang young. <laughs> and. Uh, Anyway, they pushed me further and further, and eventually I, I said, okay, I'm staying here now. And it was just, I could see nicely, it was a clear 
it was clear for, for the vehicle and, and there was nothing in front of me. And I, saw, and I heard this thing coming rrr, 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 down the road, down the road it came. And then I saw the lights and then I saw it coming around the corner and I saw the two lights. So I just took aim in between the two lights and, you know, held my breath, didn't pull the trigger, squeezed it. And luckily for me, the, the rocket went through the left-hand light and through the driver and then this, this vehicle just like screamed to a halt right in right next to me and the oaks were jumping off and of course the other you guys were shooting at them and I turned I, I rolled over and grabbed my, my, my AK and also just started shooting blindly and um, yeah and then I just lay very quiet and Pedro Kusomo and and Gavin one were shouting Rico Rick Rick are you okay are you okay and then I said yes it's me I'm here and just don't shoot me you know and that was it that was <laughs> That was the that was the vehicle that we took out. I still don't uh, know, can't remember what was on that first vehicle and what was on the way back. Uh, I remember someone saying that there were Cubans on it when it went past us first before yes. it came back. Can you remember that? Did you see anything? I, I did see. I did see uh, what looked to me like two or three people standing on it when it when it went up but i didn't i didn't notice if they were cubans or if they were you know whatever they were or swapo or anything i just remember seeing i think it was either two or three of them standing on the back of this thing but then coming back Willem, there was more of them on board and i think they had a whole lot of ammo because that uh, vehicle was exploding and banging for a long time after after we shot those guys and it was burning do you remember yeah I don't that's remember. all i can remember i don't remember much more than that I just remember you saying, yes, look, Rick, well done. I think you're the first other struck the vehicle in the unit. I don't know. I thought that's that was what happened. You know, I, I thought that's like everyday stuff, you know. That, <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> Falcon was chuffed. He, he was he was he was chuffed about that. No, I'm saying I'm glad. You know? Did you carry the RPG for a long time? Was it difficult learning it? How did you feel? How did it feel to be an RPG gunner? Man, it, it, it was lacquer, Willem, um, especially, you know, after shooting that vehicle, um, you know, I, I, I used to take, used to practice, you may remember at Omahoney we could shoot as much as we wanted to, and I used to take the RPG and a couple of rockets often down to the range at Omahoney and go and shoot. So, yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed uh, uh, the, the weapon very, very much indeed, and I got to know it quite well too. But the only, the only lousy thing about about it was sometimes was carrying it um, in the bush, you know, because it was it was long longer than an AK and it used to get stuck, and it made it you know the end of it the, the you know where it where it made a, a, a bugle type thing you know it used to catch on the branches and go ding ding all the time and that 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 was irritating, but as a weapon ah no there was it was it was superb there was ah no it was the best day eh? and. Uh, you know, if, if if you shot an RPG towards the enemy, they ran. Yeah, that even even against infantry, eh? the troops loved the RPG. They shot yep. it at infantry. They they just couldn't care. They just shot it. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> they loved it. <laughs> they loved it. Yeah. And yeah, and yourself, Rick. We had a few ambushes after that. Sometimes at mine. Sometimes uh, otherwise. Did you? Uh, did you operate the RPG after that? Did you shoot any other vehicles? No, no, unfortunately. Oh, yes, I did at, at Savati. I didn't, but it, there was nobody in it. Um, it was a it was a land cruiser or one of those lacquer Toyota things. And um, we were cleaning up. You know, that was the day that uh, you and staff Ron set fire to the um, to the Makassane and. Yeah, 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 don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we were get disposing of, of stuff, you know, and I shot this beautiful Land Cruiser. And unfortunately, uh, Ike Ikerman had, had um, hijacked this. He, he wanted to take this back to Buffalo to be his own personal vehicle. <laughs> and I shot it stuffed up, you know, and <laughs> he was quite angry about that. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been angry. <laughs> yeah, he must have been angry. <laughs> yeah, but otherwise, I didn't really shoot anything else much after that, Willem. Um, 
Yeah, then I stopped carrying it because it became, you know, it, 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 there wasn't a need for it. We we carried it normally when there was when we thought there was going to be a need for it, you know. Yeah, but um, at Savati, at Savati, um, you guys were ten stopper group teams of three men each. Uh, did you have the RPG there with you as well? No, Willem, we didn't. We um, we took um, Gavin, Fienstra, and myself instead of taking the RPG. Which is probably a good move. We opted to take, I think it was at an M, an M82 or an M81. It was M79, M79, M79 the American rocket, uh, uh, Ameri grenade, grenade launch. Eh? No, 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 not the, not, not, not the little snotnias. No, not that one. We, it was a, it was or an M62 or so. It was a disposable. It was an American disposable anti. Yeah, yeah. M seventy nine, M seventy nine, eh? M seventy nine. Oh, yeah, M seventy nine. No, wait. It was a little green thing, and you pulled it out, and you to arm it, and then you shot it, and then you threw it yeah, away. Yeah, I don't I know what exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it's the numbers uh, slip my mind, but uh, yeah. it was also called Law. I think Law L A W. Yeah, that's it. It was that. It was a little green thing. It was. Look, I don't think it was nearly as half as effective as an RPG, but. I can tell you one thing, eh? When we, when Gavin, Gavin and I shot at those dudes um, going up, going north, uh, you know, uh, after the Savati attack, they ran, eh? When, when, when we shot at, at them with, with those things, eh? Because they also made quite a noise. So, yeah. Well, I still think you guys did incredibly well there. Ten little teams and that whole brigade walked through you, hey? Yeah, it was quite hairy, eh? Yeah, because... We heard them, and then, and then Gavin said, I hear things. And so, him, you know, you remember Gav Fiennstra, uh, Willem? He was a, quite a yeah, big yeah. guy. Was a big and guy. Gav, Gavi said, yeah, Rick, shut put this. I hear something. And he, he pushed me up the tree. Yes, like, and I just saw um, vehicles and, and people walking, going, heading, you know, on the just off the road north. And I said, flip it, Gav, there's thousands of them, man. And he said, you lie. Don't talk shit, Rick. And he pulled me down, and then I had to push him up there. And he weighed like a ton, you know. So I had to push Gavin up there. And then he also agreed. He said, Rick, you, you're right. There are thousands of them. And then he found, he got a hold of me, found you. He um, radioed you and, and said, Willem, yeah, this is what it is. And you said, hit them. Because Charles Miller might be on that uh, on that convoy. And then, yeah, we didn't know if he'd been captured. Uh, we, his body hadn't been found yet. Eh? No, it hadn't, yeah. So we obviously we we obeyed your your command and we hit them. And at that same time, all the other guys ran up to join us. And um, that's when we started. And that and the the Greeks all took off eh, towards the river, and driving north, just going going. And um, yeah, we, we I don't know we were thirty O's or something, or maybe a bit more. But they ran from us, William, and there were lots of them. Eh? I think they were they were scared. You know, they got fright. You know. So yeah, that was yeah. Uh, that is what happened at Savati. We lost Alberto. Alberto was the only one killed there, hey, from our side. Yes. On our side, from the Reiki side, he, uh, he was killed. He, he was part of Peter Lipman's um, uh, um, little stick. Peter and, and Fritzy. I think it was Peter and Fritzy. They were right at the end, closest to the river. He was killed. Yeah. He what, was killed. what happened? What happened there? You know? I don't quite remember. I think he was shot, uh, Willem. I think he was shot. Um, did you shoot that Land Cruiser with a law with a with the American uh, rocket no, no. launcher? No, I shot that with a, with an RPG. But I didn't carry the RPG with me. We there was a lot of weapons lying around there, so I shot it with a, with one of their own weapons. It was after the contact, after the whole thing yeah. was over. It was when we were doing the, the cleanup. Remember? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Savati, Savati is a, a special day. Even today, the unit commemorates Savati Day. Uh, we lost 15. 15 guys got killed. I think it was 15, Willem. Yeah, yeah, it was 15 guys, eh? Charles Muller and um, Tim Patrick and um, the, the captain, uh, the other captain, what was his name? He was also intelligence. Um, Erasmus and um, Van der Walt. There was a couple of, yeah, and, and then, and then the, uh, the, um, the troops, I can't remember their names, eh, Willem? Sorry, but yeah, I'm, my memory is going, eh? That's uh, a long time ago. 1980, yeah. We did some nice operations, Willem, our little, our Ricky group. It was nice there. It was very nice. Remember, remember around the Carnation? Were you involved in Carnation as well? Yeah, uh, Carnation. Yes, I must have been, man. That was in the area around uh, Onjiva, uh, on the outskirts of Onjiva. Yeah, I was involved in that, yeah. 
that was that was where the troops um, or the companies um, came across that those beautiful nuns, wasn't it? Yeah, but, no, no, that was that was later. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that. Tell us about that uh, that episode. You remember? No, no. I'd, 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 look, I I wasn't there or, or anything, but I I remember hearing it. Yell and I laughed. And um, the the Oaks. I don't know which. I also I th- was it was it golf was it golf company or or. Anyway, I don't remember which company it was, but they, it was also near Oljiva. And I think it was, it was it, anyway, it was, I think it was Nella. Nella was in charge. Or Nella, involved. yes, Nella. And Blackie Swart was also involved in that, I think, wasn't he? I don't anyway, know. But anyway. Because Blackie was uh, was Nella's um, platoon sergeant. Oh, anyway, they, 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 they compromised this, this, this Land Rover and they stopped it without shooting it. And they held it up and they said get out get out and out of this land rover climbed two beautiful nuns i mean you must remember now the o's had been on ops for six weeks eh, and they hadn't seen a pretty woman for months because they'd been living in buffalo and uh, there were these beautiful nuns you know <laughs> so they, they couldn't believe it you know what i mean oh, i'm glad i wasn't there yeah but there were other vehicles i thought you um you were involved in that as well. There were other land cruisers or land rovers that were shot out on the outskirts of Onjiva. You you can't remember any of that. Not me, Willem. No, no, not me. Yeah. Uh, must, have been, uh, must have been John Bates there. Must have been. Okay, Rick. And otherwise, uh, what do you remember of your time in, in in the unit? Anything funny that happened? Man, I, I do remember this one story that, that I heard, um, and it, it involved uh, Sergeant Major Pep van Sale again, um, who to me was a, was an absolute legend and a you know, like a, he was my hero there. Like, I mean, he was just everything that you would imagine a soldier to be. Was he was he was it, you know? But the story goes like this: It was these two sergeants came back from a long operation, and they went up to the mess for supper. And they uh, had a few drinks, ate supper and had a few drinks. And at about just before 10 o'clock, Tolly the barman rang the bell and he said, ding dong, final round. And these two thirsty sergeants said, bullshit, you're not closing the bar, buddy. You, you better, if, if you want to stay alive, you better make sure that this pub stays open for as long as we want to drink. Anyway, th- this kind of behavior was, was regular, except when there were senior officers and, and senior NCOs around. Anyway, Tolly sort of kept the pub going, but unbeknown to the two thirsty sergeants, um, sitting under the dartboard in the shadows, uh, sipping his, 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 gently sipping on his rum and coke was Pep Van Sale, Sergeant Major Pep Van Sale, who heard uh, what what these two O's said to Tolly, the bomber. So he <laughs> he called him over and he said, yes, like, yellow man will say for not, ja. Ja, some of ons is terug van ops and ons is dors and da 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 ja, ja. So he said to Tolly, get rid of everybody in the pub. And, and he, he, he chased everybody out the pub, told him to go home. And when everybody gone, he said to Tolly, Tolly, I want three bottles of red hot rum and I want six Cokes. Now, if you can remember, the Cokes that we used to drink in those days were the little cans, you know, that you get. I don't know, was it a 300 ml or a three, 330 ml Coke? But that's what we used to drink was those. And he ordered three bottles of red hot rum and six cokes. And everybody, well, the two thirsty sergeants were very happy about this, and they drank until the, the cokes were finished. And then it was down to the hard stuff. And Pip drank with him, eh? And they proceeded to get smashed. Obviously, you know, if you drink a bottle of rum, you're going to get smashed. Anyway, they drank, and two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, they finished. And Pip said, "Right, you got to go home now." And they were drunk. And he he had a little bit of mercy with him, so he said, "Okay, you can you, you can use my my uh, my Gary." Now, Pep van Sale's Gary was the best Gary in the whole of Sector Two Zero. There was no Gary that was as neat as his. It was clean. Everything worked. The mirrors were shiny. It was Pep van Sale's pride and joy. He it was his Gary that. So the, the two guys took this Gary and they drove down to the lines. When they got as far as the parade ground, a madness hit them, and I don't know what they. Think they were doing but they started doing reckless handbrake turns and you know just general misbehavior you know and it got worse than that the one of the o's decided he wanted to hear glass breaking so he started kicking 
uh, Pep's um, mirrors, and he, they broke the windscreen, and yes, they yeah, they broke all the if, all the glass. They took it back to the got to their house, realized what they did, and hijacked a, a junior driver and told him to take it back to back to the mess. And of course, they didn't go near the mess for a week. They stayed away, and Pep cruised around do, doing his duties with his truck, and uh, he didn't say much. And then a week later, he sent a message down the lines. He said, "Listen, yeah, those two O's." Better be at supper tonight because they can't carry on eating rat packs all the time. They've got to eat proper food and they better be, if they know what's good for them, they better be at the mess tonight. Anyway, they, they yes, they heard this and they, geez, they got dressed in their best step out, you know, their step out condition browns. Everybody was in civvies, but they were in their browns. They're trying to make a big impression on him and they were there and nothing happened. They had a few beers. Nothing happened. They ate their supper. They had a few more beers and they thought, yes, we made it. We survived. And as Tully rang the final round uh, bell, Pep made his entrance. Well, yes, like everybody bombshelled out that place. Eh? Gone. Empty within seconds. And Pep stood there and he said, Ja, meneer, what did you have to with my Gary? And they didn't know what to say. They were sorry and all this shit. Anyway, he said to them, fine, that's no problem. He said, uh, there's one thing though, by tomorrow morning, breakfast time, my Gary will be fixed. And I don't care who or how you do it, but my Gary will be fixed. And I don't care of whose Gary you steal the parts to fix my, my Gary, but my Gary will be fixed. Yeah, some of yours, yeah, some of yours. And he said, oh yeah, Tony, before you go, three bottles of red hot rum and six Cokes. That was in honor of Sergeant Major Pep Van Salem. He made them drink again and fix his Gary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, he, was a, he was a character. That's, that's the, the urban legend. I don't know if it's a true story, but that's what I heard and I love that story. It honors him, it honors Pep, you know. Yeah, So how long did you stay? 82? 82 I finished, yeah. Three years, eh? Three years, yeah. Yeah. And then I clawed out and went back to Civil Street. Yeah, and when you got to Civil Street, uh, I never realized, I mean, I was sorry to see you go, uh, but uh, I never realized that you had another adventure there of a different kind. Uh, and I'm sure the listeners will, will uh, would like to hear about it. Yeah, you, Willem, I am, um, I went, uh, yeah, I am, um, I was quite interested in, in sailing and, and, and the sea, I am. Um, so, in '94, I bought I bought uh, my, a share in a in a yacht with an old oldish man and his family. I, I didn't have much experience in sailing big boats. I'd only sailed Hobie, Hobie Cats, which is a small uh, twin hulled uh, fast little boat that you sail, you know, in the bay. You know, but I did have navigational experience and common sense. But anyway, we bought the share in this boat, and we, we, our, our goal, our ambition with this was we were going to sail this boat to Mauritius, and then once we got to Mauritius, the the man who's, who was the owner and his wife and his kid would get off the boat and they would live on the land, and myself and my mate Gary Delanga would charter the boat and make bucks for all of us, you know, day cruises. Um, what, sunset cruises and that sort of stuff and yeah that was the plan and this guy was supposedly an old sea dog from way back he was a he was a guy from from belgium he was a belgium guy and his name was Vili de nice and his yacht was a his yacht was a was a was a was a a, a, a ferro a ferro a 50 foot ferro cement catch a catch rig um, but it was extremely heavy this boat was about 30 tons anyway we we headed off towards Mauritius, and in hindsight, the best way to get from Port Elizabeth to Mauritius is to is to sail in 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 a, in a south easterly direction until you get the trade winds, and then you turn north and you go up to Mauritius. But this guy knew it all, and he told us to head in a north easterly direction, just south, just on the on the southern tip of Madagascar to head. So, so in other words, um, a direct line from PE 
to Mauritius. Ah, you'll see, Willem. Um, it was 1984, and at the time that we set off for Mauritius, uh, we were two days out, and I, I, I assume that we were in the middle of the Agalis Current. The Agalis Current runs in a southerly direction, and it goes between Madagascar and Africa, and on the eastern seaboard of Madagascar, and it meets at the southern tip, and then it really flows down the east coast of South Africa, down towards the southern, you know, towards the, the, the Cape Point. Um, we were at sea, as I say, for, for two days. It was the evening. It was a very beautiful evening, and we still caught a fish, and we cooked it, and it was a wonderful evening. It, it wasn't to be like that for long, because um, at some stage of the evening, wind came, and the sea got huge. And yeah, we, myself and Gary De Lange, sailed that boat for that whole night, the whole of the next day, and the whole of that next night, until the following morning. Both of him on one side of the wheel, and myself on the other side of the wheel, and we would just shout, left, right, whichever way we thought the boat had to go. Because when you got to the top of the swells, you'd look down, it was a, it was a full moon as well, eh? and the wind was howling, it was unbelievable. And you'd, it looked like you were on top of a high-rise building, and you would sail down into the, into the trough of this wave and then up the other side again. If you took a line that was too steep, that boat would broach. In other words, it would, it would go nose first into the bottom of the swell and, and turn over. That was the fear that we had. Um, the the, the so-called skipper of this boat just went to bed and left it up to us to you know to sail this boat, which we did. Anyway, the, the, eventually this it was terrifying, really. I, I mean, I was I got scared now and again in the army, but I want to tell you something now. I was really really scared during this storm at sea. It was it was a cyclone called Cyclone Tamoina, which left mayhem up the east coast of Africa in the 80s in the, in 84. The wind speeds were recorded as high as 170 to 200 kilometers an hour. So yeah, it was a serious, serious storm. It was bad. Anyway, the storm ended two days or, or you know whatever, however many days later, and we, I saw him. I, I, I looked and I, I saw that we were near, not near, but we were quite far away. But I saw mountains, and yes, I said to myself. Luxem, those mountains look like the Swartberg, because we did um, we did a fast bait five in those mountains, and they look very like they look very very similar to the Swartberg mountains. And I said this to him, and he said, "No ways, never. No, we near Richards Bay, man. Jesus, we, it's, there's no ways we we near George." I said, "But I want to tell you something now. Those mountains look to me like the Swartberg. No, it's impossible." And he was getting aggressive. Anyway, he went back to bed, so I took the RDF, and RDF is a little instrument that you that you uh, point towards, it picks up the, uh, the it picks up the Morse code of a, of a lighthouse, and you you you, you identify the, the Morse, you know, the, 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 you, you identify the lighthouse, you you you, you, tra you track the um, you track the bearing of the of that lighthouse, then you pick up another lighthouse, and you track that bearing, and where the two crosses meet, that's where you are. So I picked up Mossel Bay Lighthouse and I picked up Cape St. Francis Lighthouse and we were off the coast of George and those were the Swartberg. Anyway, I explained to him and I proved to him that it was and eventually he had to he had to admit that he was wrong and the boat was so badly stuffed up from the, from the storm that we actually limped back to Port Elizabeth to fix the boat and to start again about three weeks later. And yeah, we eventually got to Mauritius and as soon as we got there, the son of a bitch kicked us off his boat, never returned our money, and there we were, stuck in Mauritius with no home. Luckily for us, we uh, befriended um, an American guy who was a proper dinkum sailor and he, he took us on board his boat and we spent the time cruising the Indian Ocean Islands with him, which was a, which was a much better bet than sailing with that other idiot anyway, so we had a good time. But didn't the business from Bok hit him? Didn't you? I, I can't remember. Didn't you say that uh, uh, he got his upcoming summer? 
he did guy, yeah, he, he did Willem. He um he you know he he had such a bad attitude um that all the yachties uh, the, all all the yacht the yacht they called yachties all the yachties um camped or stayed at, at a place in the on the northern side of Mauritius called Grand Bay. And of course everybody talks, etc. 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 And um you know after he booted us off the boat he wasn't very popular because people heard how he treated us uh, at sea and he wasn't a skipper's boss man. I mean he was just nowhere. He was useless. And um he because of his bad attitude to all the other yachties he was ostracized. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, he, he he was stuck on Mauritius for a number of years because he could not in any way sail that boat on his own. He had to have a crew to do it with him. And yeah, he you know he was stuck on Mauritius for years because you know the, the story, his history preceded him and people that came, they heard about it and they didn't want nothing to do with him. Anyway, a couple of years after that, um, he managed to get two young guys to to sail his boat back to Durban, and obviously there was he treated them badly too, and they stopped in in Reunion Island on their way back to Durban, and there his boat caught fire, and he he was he was he was quite severely burnt, and that was the last I heard I heard about that guy. I don't know where he is or what happened to him, and you know what I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, so things happen. It's I believe in the Blana Sambok, you know the Blana Sambok. Eh? Yeah, do yeah. something it's bad deliberately, then somehow, somewhere along the line, it will get, come and get you. That always does, Philip. Every dog has yeah. his day. So, what are these islands like? You said you you sailed around uh, the Indian Ocean. There, did you get to other islands? We did, Joe. Yeah. We went. Uh, we went. We sailed north of Mauritius to a lovely archipelago group called the Saint Brennan Group. It lies about, I'd say, about three or four hundred nautical miles to the north west of um, of Mauritius. And there, th 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 that we we sailed that boat. We and I mean, this guy, the skipper that we sailed with, this guy could sail. Eh? I mean, he's he's done three or four. Around the world trips, he, well, that's all he does. He just he's, he's a very very wealthy guy. He made millions and millions of dollars um, in the building industry, and all he does is sail his boat around the world. And in fact, I've seen him again since then. He, he stopped it off in P a few years ago, and we met up and had had, had a couple of beers together. But um, he um, he found this this little group of islands um, during the night, eh? And it was also rough weather. It was there was another little bit of a storm that hit us while we approached this, these islands. And at that stage, you must remember, it, there was no GPS as, as as we know it now. The only navigational aid that well, the best navigational aid that you could get then was a sat nav. And you know you'd lose signal and da 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 da. But anyway, Bob found this island and or well, this group of islands, and we approached the islands at night. I was once again, quite bung because I didn't want to get wrecked like, like Robertson Crusoe, you know. And we, we, he, he, he told us to pull the sails down, which we did, and he started the motor, and he motored around this island to the lee side of this island. And once we got to the lee side of the island, it was quiet. You know, the, the wind was still blowing in, in the mast, but we were sheltered. And we we, we, we we had anchor watch for the rest of the night where, you know, one of us stays awake, for a couple of hours and you call the next oak and that's how it goes. And that morning, I was on anchor watch when the, when the sun came up. Yes, it was like being, it was like out of a movie, man. I mean, by now the wind had gone and it was a, it was a lovely day and the sun was coming up and I just looked towards this island. I saw palm trees and white beaches and blue, blue sea. Yes, and that was that was our trip to St. Brennan. We shot fish there. That was wonderful. And... Um, some of the islands are totally uninhabited, and the one, the main St. Brennan Island is inhabited by fishermen. And these fishermen are actually um, doing a, a penalty to the Mauritius government. Uh, they, they are, they got into shit in Mauritius for bad debt, and they were sent to this island 
to catch a quota of fish equivalent to the debt that they owed. So they weren't bad criminals, but they were working off they were working off their loan, if you can call it, to the government. And yeah, you know, we met these these guys, and they were nice, and we had fun with them, and we talked to them, and it was interesting. It was a really really like a trip that it was. Yeah, it was it was a I would say one of the highlights of my life. It was very nice, and you know I can just thank Bob Taylor, the guy who who adopted us on Mauritius, uh, that gave us that wonderful uh, experience. And did he get you back to South Africa at some stage? Yes, no, we um, we had to, well, he had to keep, you know, he we spent uh, three or four months um, in, the, in those, in those in the Indian Ocean Islands, sailing from island to island, and then back to Mauritius, and then back to Reunion, and then from Reunion back to Durban. And, um, yeah, we sailed from Reunion to Durban, and we, we actually broke the record. Um, from from Reunion to Durban, five five and a half days. It's got that's, fast. That's fast. That's, oh, that's, yeah. that's moving it. Yeah, I mean, we had the spinnaker up most of the time, and that boat was cruising at, at, at 16, 17 knots. So, I mean, it was humming. It was beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah, that was also a very nice highlight day. Yeah, but as I say, this guy could sail. He was a real dinkum sailor. You know, he knew what he was doing, and, you know, with him at the helm, you know, you oh, you just don't have you don't have no worries. Eh? After that, you never went back to the sea. You just uh, didn't when want I to. Did, no, I did. I, I sailed for many years after that. I, I I was a crew on a on a boat here in PE, and we won many many races. I've got lots of trophies to prove it. Uh, we and I, but the, but then I you know it, it, it gets a bit much because every weekend you are obliged to go on a Saturday and then you race on a Sunday or you race on a Saturday and then you've got to work on the boat on a Sunday. So yeah, you, you know, you be, it becomes a bit much and you you know, you don't have much of a life except working on the boat and sailing. And then I had too much of it. So I realized, wach now, wach now, I'm going to go fishing now. So I, I, I stopped sailing and I haven't sailed again for a while. I miss it, but yeah, you know, I made, I made that, that call. So you went fishing? No, just fishing off the, you know, just normal fishing, you know, trout fishing and river fishing and that sort of stuff instead of sailing all the time. <laughs> okay, that's not as your main occupation, not as your main occupation. No, 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 no it wasn't, Willem. No, no Rick, uh, another thing I want to ask you is you've been in PE most of your life and uh, there's a strong veteran community there and from what I see and hear and experience myself when I went past there, uh, there's a lot of different units uh, and a lot of listeners are veterans as well or got to do with veterans. What, what's it like? What's the, uh, what would you say is the, um, is this uh, veteran thing is it is it something that's only come up the last few years there's interest in the border war in in our defense force or what do you think you know Philip, that's a uh, that's a seriously interesting question eh? um, uh, and yeah there, in the last number of years um i would say from about 2010 it, there has been a remarkable Interest expressed um, in in the SADF and in the ver in in certain units of the SADF, and I must say our, our little our group of pals here in the, in the Eastern Cape. Um, well, it started. We started the three two VA here in PE with with three guys: Nico Grunewald, myself, and Mace van der Westhuizen. And we and because we were such a small group of people at that time, we we invited our pals, um, Floppy Lutz and Neil Wallace, to join us because you know having a having a scow skier with three O's is, is lacquer, but I mean the more the merrier, you know. And those two guys were SAF pilots; they were chopper pilots. Anyway, from there, Willem, it's just grown and grown and grown. Eh? And I, I mean, now the, the 3-2 VA, the PE 3-2 VA, we, we must have at least 35 members that we've dug out the woodwork. And we have numerous chopper guys that have joined us as well. 
um, because a lot of a lot of the SAF guys that bought their way out of the Air Force after the you know at, after the war or whatever ended up working for SA Airways, and these guys can live any in any in any city they want to because if they put their uniforms on, they jump on a plane, they don't have to pay. They get a ride up to Joburg where they have to work from, and you know, happy days, you know, and then and vice versa, coming home again. So there's a lot of a lot of ex SAF guys that that live in PE because PE is a lack of place, and they, they like it here. So yeah, we've we've got a good a good bunch of of guys. Six one Mech. We've got a, a couple of SAS guys, Rhodesian SAS guys, and I think you know them. Um, yeah, three two guys, recce guys, and air force guys, and we, we we're a good bunch of guys. We have fun together, and it's lucky to meet. We meet up at least three times a year, where we where we have a brian, and we have, we have we have beers and we talk, and it's nice. Yeah, yeah. And as you said, P is a lack of place. <laughs> Say again, Willem. Sorry. <laughs> as you said, P is a lack of place. That's a lack of place. Yeah, it is. It's friendly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you must watch out. Just now, just now, the whole of Paris is going to go and convoy and come and visit you. That's lucky. They welcome them as come. We'll show them what it's like here. <laughs> okay, Rick. Uh, thanks very, very much for uh, coming to join us. And uh, yeah, I think uh, having told us the story about the sea, we normally close off with uh, honouring someone from those days and I think maybe tonight we'll we'll do it for all those who served on the sea because we had a navy we had one or two guys already speaking to us on this program and uh, yeah let's think of them because to be quite honest when I first heard your story about that boat uh, I don't know what I would have done I would have probably crawled away in a corner and and dung us on myself. That that must be horrifying, as you said, more scary than any bush experience. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much, Rick. And um, if you want to say something uh, to the listeners, especially to the younger ones, um, what do you think? What did the SADF do to you? Was it a bad experience? Good experience? What do you think? No, Willem. Um, certainly, um, if if I could give any young guy any word of advice, I would, I would say that doing a couple of years in the army is, is definitely worth it, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it, and it's it's something that you'll always remember for the rest of your life, and you build you build friendships there which can never be destroyed. And Willem, thanks for having me, and it's you know it's such a great pleasure to speak to you, and and I hope that the audience um, liked our stories. Thank you very much, Willem. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, and uh, let's close off. Cheers, man. Thanks.